In Finality, Pastor in Chapter 7 I should know you. The words fell in a pathetic rush from Techno's mouth. I should, but I don't. The little girl who was his sister, had been his sister just a few seconds before, stared at him with wide eyes that were like twin pools of ancient water, reflecting his own strained face back at him. Her question echoed in his head, a chant, an accusation, and a lament. What's my name? What's my name? What's my name? Techno wrenched his hand away from hers and scrambled backwards, his breaths coming fast and harsh. She frowned after him, but did not move to follow. You're my sister, he sobbed, clutching the hand that had held hers so gently, so familiarly. But I don't even remember your name. Hers, and their siblings, and their fathers and mothers. Once knowledge as common as air, now slipping from his fingers. He stared at her, begging the universe to give him one syllable, one letter. He would take anything. He would take breadcrumbs. I killed you, he whispered, falling into the dirt, a puppet with no master. He put his head in his shaking hands. I killed all of you. No. The sternness in her voice made him look up. She still stood where she had been, a pillar of stone, her face pink with fury. That wasn't you. The spider got you, that's all. That's all? Techno shouted. The forest was pressing in on them, he knew it. The darkness would take him again, just as it had took him all those years ago, the last time he'd been down this road. Yes, she replied. Yes, that is all. It was all him, never you. We understood that then, we understand that now. Nobody blamed you, or will ever blame you for something you could not control. We're not that horrible, or that stupid. But I hurt you, Techno whispered. I know I did. You must have been so scared. I wasn't, she said, but Techno knew it was a lie by the wobbling of her lower lip. You would never hurt me. I knew that. She stepped closer, slowly, as if she were approaching a wounded wolf. And it's important to me that you know that, too. Something flickered in Techno's periphery, and they both turned to see the forest open just up ahead. Beyond the darkness, there was a small clearing, blazing with sunlight. Surrounded by flower patches and shrubbery was a house, small and cozy with a brick chimney letting out pale smoke. A window was open, and through it, Techno could see a table set for dinner, and children fighting over an apple pie. A tall, wiry man with his pink hair pulled back from his face was swatting at them with no real force, telling them to share, you greedy little monsters. A woman with braided hair stood to the side and threw her head back in a deep laugh. One of the kids leaned too far in the scuffle, and fell face first into a bowl of mashed potatoes, and began wailing. An older child, almost as old as Techno, rolled her eyes warmly and promised to do anything he wanted if he would just stop crying. Techno saw all of them. None of them saw Techno. They're calling me back, the little girl said. But Techno couldn't take his eyes off the house and the family that lived in it. His house once. His family. Warm and lovely and easy. I can't go home yet, Techno said, hating himself more and more with every word. I still... I still have to save Wilbur and Filza. I still have to bury Tommy. And I still have to put that green bastard into the goddamn ground. Well, duh. When he turned to her again, she had her hands on her hips and a sad smile on her face. I said they were calling me back. No one said anything about you. Not everything's about you, you know. Despite everything, Techno managed a weak laugh. Of all the people to be my guide through this shit afterlife, why'd well, have to be you? Because my spirit's too big for my own body, she replied haughtily. And I'm tired of some random man deciding my lives for me. He didn't even ask if I wanted to be a human being. What if I wanted to be a frog in the rain? Did he ever consider that? No. Instead, he made me small and stinky and boring. She wrinkled her nose in disgust. I want to be more than someone else's backstory. I'm going to be the hero next time. Just you watch. I already am, Techno said softly. In the distance, he could hear the laughter of people he used to know by heart. But closer, somewhere just behind him, he heard a voice calling his name. Techno turned towards the voice. He would always turn toward that voice. There was only the forest off the path, broken branches and nothingness. But still, somehow, he knew he would be safe in it. He shakily rose to his feet, each small movement sending electricity through his veins. 
His old bones knew he should be going with her, going home, and starting the cycle anew. The wheel had to move forward. This was not how the real story ended. But screw the wheel. Screw what the storyline dictated. He was Technoblade, and he was going to write his own damn story. He stood his ground, felt the wheel push at his back, shoving him roughly forward. But if he was even as half as stubborn as the little girl before him, he knew he had nothing to fear. The ground held beneath him. He passed a hand over his misty eyes. I have to go, he said tiredly. Wilbur's looking for me. She grinned. So keep going, you slow old man. I'm not that old. Whatever you say, Grandpa, she replied, taking one step toward the light, and then another. Oh, before I forget, everyone wanted to tell you something. He leaned towards her. What is it? She leaned toward him. You look dumb with that hairstyle, she whispered gravely. Please keep your hair out of your face, because it's starting to function like curtains. You little brat. Techno moved to grab her, but she danced out of the way, laughing so hard she almost tripped over her own feet. She moved to go again, but stopped at the very end of the road, silhouetted against the sunlight. You know, for what it's worth, she said, turning just enough for Techno to see a faint smile on her face. I think the Green God made the right call this time around, making you my older brother. You were pretty great at it. Before I murdered all of you, Techno said, his throat burning from a stoppered sob. You can't ever just accept a compliment, can you? It wasn't that great of a compliment to begin with. Fine, I take it back. Don't you dare, Techno began, but she was already gone. Always have to have the last word, he thought fondly, glad to even have that small scrap of her to take with him into the dark. He folded the memory of her running home, twin braids bouncing against her shoulder blades with each excited step, and tucked it behind his heart, where it would always be safe. She would stay there, right next to the little house with the laughing strangers. Right next to Tommy. He took a deep breath, filling his lungs with the smell of pine trees and flowers and apple pies, and stepped off the path. He walked first, then ran, ducking under branches and shaking his feet out of the tangled undergrowth, tearing through the dim with only Wilbur's voice to guide him. Techno! Will? Closer now, stray branches tugged at his clothes and his hair. With his sister's advice, and from pure annoyance, Techno ripped a strip of cloth from his shirt sleeve and tied his hair back into a simple knot at the nape of his neck. It wasn't an elegant braid, but it would have to do. He continued running. Wilbur! He called again. Techno! Just to the right of him. Techno! Over here! Techno! Techno fell against a tree, taking in what was before him. A strange, dark line stood out in the dim, blacker than black, cut straight from the darkness of the lowest cave of the earth. It felt... lonely. Standing beside it, wings tucked in close, was Filza. And Wilbur. Come on, Wilbur said, a half-smile on his face. You're late. Techno rushed to him and gave him a swift punch to the shoulder. Wilbur stumbled, almost falling back into whatever the black cut was, before Techno caught him by the wrist and pulled him upright again. How many times do I have to lose you in a single day? Techno demanded, squeezing Wilbur's wrist just to make sure he was real. He was here. He wasn't part of this strange dreamscape. Wilbur rubbed sheepishly at his shoulder and said, I didn't really have a say in it. Keep close to me from now on, Techno ordered, releasing Wilbur after he was sure the pulse at his wrist was there. And you, he turned to Filza, ready to unleash his pent-up emotions on the nearest god available. But the fraught words died on his lips when he took in his old friend. You look... different. Filza shrugged one shoulder. It's been a long few hours. He saw Tommy, Wilbur added by way of explanation. Is he okay? Techno asked, stepping towards Filza. Filza shook his head. We can talk about it later he said, sounding strangled. Techno understood. It would take him years to speak about what happened on that road. For now, it was his own burden to carry alone. Someday he'd share it, but not when the wound was too fresh, too hurting. All right, Techno said. That's okay. So how the hell are we getting out of here? He still had a score to settle, and a prince to bury after all. Wilbur nodded wordlessly toward the pulsing black scar in the air. Oh, you have got to be kidding me. Techno said. It's safe, Wilbur said. Say that again without looking so green and I might believe you. It's a cut through reality, Filza said exasperatedly. Of course it wouldn't be a very comfortable experience. Wilbur scoffed. It felt like having my innards rearranged by a very excitable toddler. He heaved a resigned sigh as he faced the cut. I guess I'll go first. He threw a look at the other two behind him. See you on the other side then? 
I'll follow soon, said Techno. Don't get lost again. Wilbur gave him a mocking salute before falling into the void. He swallowed him whole. Techno watched him disappear with a sinking feeling in his gut. Before a heartbeat had even passed, he was already moving forwards, intending to follow behind Wilbur as he'd promised. He would not let him out of his sight again. But before Techno could step through, a hand closed around his arm and pulled him back. He turned towards Filza, a complaint already on his lips, before he noticed the somber look on the other god's face. He really did look different. He was quieter, somehow, and yet brighter at the same time, like a young star silently basking in its newfound brilliance. Techno, Filza said, we need to talk. Wilbur was being unmade, that was what it was. As he fell through the black, spiraling between what was real and what was imagined, drifting in the space between lie and truth, he felt himself being pulled apart, and then pulled back together, born, and then unborn, and then reborn, and unmade. Father had called it the crash, but that wasn't quite true. It was crashing, and flying, and crashing again. The euphoria of flight equaled by the pain of the collapse. It was agony. It was dawn. And it was over. He hit the ground. He breathed in, breathed out. The air tasted bitter, like ash. Like the dust on a guitar case, sitting unopened for years. His ears were ringing, his vision blurring. There was nothing beyond the feel of cold snow under him, coarse and biting. His muddled mind could grasp no thought other than, I need a blanket. He spat snow and blood out of his mouth and struggled upright, managing to get on his knees before he fell back again. What fight there was left in his body fleeing as his vision finally cleared, and he realized he was watching the end of the world. The sky was red. The city was burning. Fissures arced across the ground like lightning, chasms leading straight to the underworld. As Wilbur looked on, the earth shook again, and more cracks spread one breaking open just feet away from him. Shit, Wilbur thought, scrambling back, his heart in his throat. Shit, shit, shit. The only structure that remained relatively intact was the church, and standing in its bell tower, at the eye of the storm, was none other than Dream. He didn't seem to notice Wilbur's reappearance. How could he? In the same way that giants paid no heed to ants, the god had bigger affairs to tend to than a single mortal standing in the wreckage of the only universe he had ever known. Dream paced around the circumference of the bell, trailing a hand on its bronze surface, only pausing when another earthquake hit. It took Wilbur a few dizzy beats to realize he was causing it. With a tilt of his head and a flick of his fingers, the god was slowly breaking the world apart, remaking it into another vision, another stage. Wilbur barely registered the thud of another person falling behind him. What the- Wilbur turned to watch Techno blink groggily at the scene before them, waking from a dream and straight into a nightmare. He already looked so exhausted, pink hair tied loosely back from a face that had seen better days. He was so pale, the only color on his face the dark lines under his eyes. How long had they been fighting? It felt like years, but it was only hours. What's going on? Techno croaked. The apocalypse, Wilbur returned. Techno groaned as he fell against the ground, burying his face in his arms. Five minutes, he said. Let me have five goddamn minutes without having to deal with this. We don't have that much time, father said. Wilbur raised his head to see his father touching down on the ground behind him, soundless as the night. His eyes scanned the broken city around him, before settling on Techno and Wilbur's discarded weapons. And, because Wilbur could never catch a fucking break, they were sitting leagues away on a slice of earth, separated from the dozen crisscrossing lines of fissures. When do we ever have enough time? Techno's voice was muffled by the snow. Five minutes, that's all I'm asking. Wilbur groaned in sympathy, even as he accepted Father's offered hand and got to his feet. He reached down and grabbed the back of Techno's tunic, hauling him up so that Techno leaned on him while he leaned on his father. The three of them, exhausted in all sense of the word, watched his dream continued breaking and shattering everything that no longer fit whatever story he wanted to tell next. I'll get your weapons, Father said and Wilbur expected him to fly away to retrieve them, but instead, he simply snapped his fingers, and Wilbur's sword and bow and Techno's trident and chain whip clattered at their feet. Wilbur glanced with shock at his father. When did you learn that nifty little trick? Must have picked it up somewhere, father muttered, as Techno wordlessly rearmed himself. Wilbur bent to retrieve his bow and rapier, surprised to find that his quiver was once again filled with more arrows, with gleaming obsidian feathers as fletching. These gods, Wilbur thought, I'll never understand their silly games. This is it then, Techno said as he spun his trident idly between his fingers. This ends here. Everything ends here. How do we do this? Wilbur asked. 
The last time we thought we had him cornered, he just shoved us into some other realm and went on his merry way. I won't give him the chance this time, Father said sternly. Sweat was beating on Techno's forehead despite the cold, but his words were steady when he said, We'll be your support, Phil. Now go. Not yet, Father said, turning to Wilbur. He lifted his cloak and reached into its inner pocket, pulling out a silver necklace. He pressed it into Wilbur's palm and leaned in to whisper in Wilbur's ear, Find what is sacred to you, and never let go. If you take any advice from your old man, let it be that. Why does it feel like you're saying goodbye? Wilbur whispered back, curling his fingers around the necklace. Father stepped back with a small, sad smile. I'm not, he said. It's just in case. Just in case, Wilbur demanded. In case of what? Another one-shouldered shrug. Worst case scenario. Wilbur placed the necklace into his pocket. Sure, he said. Let's lie to ourselves. It should be easy. We've been doing it for years now, haven't we? Father blinked and looked as if he were about to say something else, but the earth trembled again. A harsh laugh cut through the cold air. The three of them turned to see the green god had finally caught sight of them. He stood at the edge of the bell tower, balanced on the balls of his feet, as if the dizzying height was of no consequence to him. Even from so far below, Wilbur could see the jagged line of his smile carved into his face. Hello, he called out. Didn't expect you back so soon, I admit. He spread his arms to take in the chaos all around them. But I guess destruction is more fun when there are witnesses. Wilbur closed his hand around the hilt of his rapier. Despite the ache in his soul, he was ready. With Techno on one side and his father on the other, there was little else he needed. The northern winds whistled past them, and Wilbur listened carefully. He could almost hear the song they were trying to sing. There were no words left to be said. They had done this a thousand times. They took off, Bilza to the skies and Techno and Wilbur rushing across the ruined ground. Phil would get to the tower first, but the other two would not be far behind. They leapt over chasm after chasm, skidding on snow and falling to their knees, but still moving forward, heading towards the church. Every jump rattled Techno's bones and made him want to cry out, but he pushed it all down. The world was being torn apart by an all-powerful, bored little shit. Technoblade had no right to complain about something as inconsequential as a potentially sprained ankle. And then, suddenly, it wasn't inconsequential. It was an easy jump. He could have made it should have made it, but instead, he came up short, an inch shy of safety. Technoblade fell quietly. There was a sharp tug, and his shoulder almost popped out of its socket as his plunge was abruptly halted. He looked up, legs dangling in open air, and found Wilbur leaning over the edge with his hands around Techno's wrist, his only lifeline. Gods, Wilbur cursed, struggling with Techno's weight. Pull yourself up, Techno. Techno's boots scrambled for purchase on the chasm's face. He could feel Wilbur's hands slipping, but Techno knew Wilbur would more readily let them both fall than let go. That was how Techno knew he'd already found family again. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, his left foot found a steady spot to carry most of his weight. With some awkward maneuvering, Techno managed to haul himself over the edge, breathing heavily with his hands on his knees, but on solid ground once more. What the hell? Wilbur demanded. You and your grand speeches about never losing me again, but did you ever stop to ask if I could afford to lose you? Get a fucking grip. Techno pushed his hair out of his eyes and blinked slowly at the furious king. Okay, Techno said quietly. I'm sorry. Are you alright then? Wilbur asked, anger quickly evaporating into concern. We have to go help father. I don't think he needs our help, Techno thought, squinting up at the bell tower. From this angle, he couldn't see much, but he could hear it all. The clash of steel on steel, and the distant thuds of two godly beings absolutely trying their best to kill the other. I'm alright, assured Techno. And even if Wilbur didn't seem to believe him, they had no other choice but to soldier on. They were off again, leaping from one broken chunk of earth to another, albeit a bit more cautiously, constantly looking over their shoulders to make sure the other had made it safely. When they finally made it to the foot of the bell tower, the pain in Techno's ankle had reached a boiling point, and only intensified when Wilbur pushed the tower door open, and they were met with a staircase spiraling into the sky. I hate this, Techno declared. I hate every aspect of this. I would like to quit and become a humble farmer far from here. Wilbur stared at him, giving him two seconds to follow through on his words. Are you done? Wilbur said. Because in case you haven't noticed, the end of all things is currently being orchestrated right above our heads. I regret ever meeting you. Wilbur snorted as he started up the stairs. You say that as if it isn't your dry humor that rubbed off on me. They took the steps two at a time, round and round until Techno couldn't remember life before the climb. 
It wasn't until they were halfway there when Techno's knees finally gave up and he slumped against the brick wall, panting and biting back a scream of frustration. He was holding them back. It was the most important battle of his goddamn life, and he was holding them back. Wilbur, standing a few steps up from Techno, looked back with furrowed brows. What's wrong? he asked. You look... you look pale. This isn't like you. He took in the sweat dripping from Techno's face, the exhaustion evident in his trembling shoulders and liquid limbs. Techno? You're right, Techno murmured, too tired to care about what he was saying. I'm not myself. I'm not even a fraction of what I used to be. I hate this fragile body, and all its whining, and all its petty demands. He looked up, met Wilbur's eyes, willing him to understand, because there was no way in hell he could ever speak the words himself. He didn't have the vocabulary for it. I hate being this weak, Wilbur. Wilbur's mouth fell open in a silent O, oh, as realization finally hit him. Before, all this would have been effortless. The leaping, the running, the climbing. Something as small as a sprained ankle or a healing stab wound would have been no hindrance at all. Just little details to shake off like bothersome bugs. But that was before. This was now. Techno, Wilbur whispered. You're mortal? It had been written in an ancient script, in a book that looked exactly like all the others in the forgotten library, heavy bound and dust covered. Wilza had flipped gingerly through it, afraid that one wrong move could turn the fragile paper into ash and he had found the words on the last pages. You seek power, reader, but all things come with a price. Power for power, divinity for divinity. If you wish to be a god among gods, one must be the vessel, the other, sacrifice. Vilza had promised it would be their last resort, only if push came to shove, Techno had said. And the green god had definitely shoved. And so Filza had pulled Techno back, and the two of them had talked, one god to another, for the last time. They had known it was time, just as they had known, that first day on the battlefield of ice and snow, arrows flying overhead, and the both of them lit from within by divine fire, that their roads had crossed, and there was no going back. Technoblade, blood god and emperor, had offered his scarred hands to Filza, angel of death and god of freedom, and they had clasped each other's fingers like old friends did after a long separation. For a moment, there was only the two of them in that forest of dreams. And when Filza whispered the ancient words, it almost sounded like a solemn prayer. A prayer to the god Techno used to be, and to the god Filza was becoming. Toward the end, Techno's hands had betrayed his pain. It shook, just a bit, as his veins burned gold, turning him into gilded patchwork. Half mortal, half god. His very soul caught in the crossfire between mortality and divinity. His breaths came quick and labored, and still Filza murmured, slipping silent apologies between the primordial spell. When the final word was said, Techno had fallen to his knees before Filza, a wicked reversal of fortunes. But he did not let go. Techno forsook his godhood without protest. There was barely a struggle, barely a scream of agony. It had been his sacrifice to make, and he would be damned if he would let himself regret it. He had wrestled with martyrdom, and won. When Techno stood again, he was human, simple and breakable, with numbered years and numb hands. Inside him, there was a hollow pit where his godhood used to rest. He was going to make a landfill out of it. And Filza was awake. Now, he stood in a bell tower overlooking a ruined city. Fires raged until the horizon, burning away homes and streets that had once teemed with easy life. Friends and families gathered in bunches like sweet-smelling bouquets. But like flowers, unaware of the gardener's plucking hands, they existed in the shadow of a being too large to comprehend, their lives already decided for them. All their tragedies and loves, their hopes and their secrets, laid into predetermined places on the green god's mosaic. But that would end today, because Filza was his antithesis, and he was going to set everybody free. The bell tolled as he and Dream continued their deadly dance around the tower, swords meeting and then unmeeting. Dream must have sensed the change. He must have seen it in the way Filza moved, taking each step with utmost confidence that the ground would meet him and not the other way around. He must have felt it in the renewed strength behind Filza's blows, he must have known Filza was still holding back. For the first time since their encounter, the green god had the wits to finally be unnerved. One mistake was all it took, a misstep in their eons old waltz. The green god swung too early, his sword cutting through the air as Filza simply ducked out of the way. The bell shuddered as Dream's blade bit into the bronze and stuck there. As Dream tried to pull it free, Filza kicked at his knees and sent him spinning against one of the pillars holding up the tower's roof, unarmed. 
Dream stumbled against the pillar, nearly toppling over the edge of the tower, and before he could regain his balance, Filza swung at him. Dream managed to duck just in time, but Filza's sword cut through the pillar behind him, as easy as a hot knife through butter. The pillar buckled and fell apart, and the roof of the tower began leaning, almost halfway into caving in on itself. The green god whistled as he jumped back from Filza's advance. Listen, Filza, I'm done listening to you. Filza swung again, this time managing to nick Dream's forearm. Brilliant red blood ran from the cut. It did not heal. Dream looked down at his wounded arm, his brows furring with confusion. Why did that hurt? He asked no one in particular. He raised his eyes to Phil, and his confusion turned to fury. What have you done? The very thing you tried to keep me from doing, Filza said, raising his sword above his head. Now hold still, Dream. Let me take everything away from you, as you took everything from me. The green god made to raise his hand, perhaps to conjure himself a new sword, or attempt to throw Filza into another dream. Filza's hand shot out, gripping Dream's wrist and twisting. He leaned in to watch the other god's discomfort turn to pain, turn to panic, as he struggled to free himself from Filza's crushing hold. Little spider, Filza whispered, caught in your own web. You think this phases me? Dream demanded, still trying to pull his wrist away. Do you think I'm afraid of you? The angel of death looked at the green god with the eyes of a son taken too soon. Yes, he said. I think you are. Dream snarled, an animal cornered. You forgot you've tried this before. You've always failed. Always. Ah, but that was before I came to realize what you were. Filza made sure Dream could see every inch of his expression, every depleted line, every mark the long years had etched into his skin. You would have us think that you're doing all this. It rewrites the infinite loop, just for the fun of it. But you don't really have the luxury to indulge yourself, do you? Because you're afraid. Every second of every day of every life, you're afraid. You have known me since you were made. You have known since your first breath that I was the only creature capable of breaking you. And before I could even try, before you gave me any reason to, you ran. You pretended it was all some silly game to keep your heart from exploding out of your chest with fear. And you ran. You sculpted worlds, rewrote histories just to keep me from seeing you squirm. Because you're a coward. That's what you are, Dream. You're a goddamn coward. You take that back, the green god whispered. Take that back right now. Make me, challenged Filza. Oh wait, you can't. They were equal forces once upon a time. The spider and the songbird, control and freedom. The two oldest powers in the universe, the first of the gods, maintaining a delicate balance until one tipped the scale. Filza was merely tipping it back. You bought yourself some time, Filza said, eons of it. But the clock is ticking, and there's nowhere else to run. The game is over. Dream was breathing heavily, his emerald eyes wide. You can hurt me, he said, but you can't kill me. You can't. That's not, that's not how we do this. We'll always be hunting each other. You have the upper hand now, but not forever. You're right. Filza loosened his hold on Dream, allowing him to step away. The green god gave him a look of mistrustful confusion as he rubbed his wrist where Filza's hand had left scorch marks. I can't kill you. If I did, you'd simply be reborn, and the chase will continue. I know that now. I also know what I have to do. He glanced over Dream's shoulder, and the other god turned on his heel to follow Filza's line of sight, and he finally saw what Filza meant. He whirled around with an incredulous, almost fearful expression. You can't be serious, Dream said, voice trembling. You, you can't be. Then, regaining a bit of confidence, he said, No, you really can't be, because I just break out. I can carve my way out, little by little. Not if you have someone always watching you, Filza said simply. What little hope the green god still had died in his eyes. You're an idiot, he declared, equal parts disbelief and alarm. He moved towards Filza, grabbing fistfuls of his tunic and shaking him. It would be the closest to begging he would stoop to. Do you have any idea what I would lose? What you would lose? All things come with a price, Filza said, surprised by the sudden burn of tears in his eyes. And I pay it so they don't have to. I'm done running away from my problems. I'm done begging the stars for answers. I've brought the stars low, Dream, and they will do my bidding for me. Why does it feel like you're saying goodbye? Wilbur had asked. Because he was. He'd said his farewells, even if he was the only one who truly knew it. He pressed one last gift into his son's hands, but his eyes had been on Techno when he'd spoken of never letting go. So Techno might understand, in hindsight, 
ten days or ten years from now that Filza was leaving Wilbur to him, and him to Wilbur. Behind the green god, far below in the middle of a broken earth, was a cut in the universe, a jagged gate to a place of unmaking. It stood waiting, waiting for a green-eyed god and his keeper, a prison of infinite void for the two loneliest gods on earth. Filza grabbed Dream's wrists once more, manacles of flesh and blood. It's been you and me since the beginning, Dream, Filza said solemnly, and it'll be me and you in the end. Father? Filza froze. What are you doing? What are you doing? Phil? What are you doing? What are you doing? Wilbur repeated. Filza turned slowly toward the tower's threshold, where Wilbur stood with one hand on the jam and the other around Techno's shoulders. Wilbur was the only force keeping Techno upright at the moment. By the look on Filza's face, he must have expected Techno to weigh Wilbur down with the novelty of his mortality. Ignorant to the fact that Techno's sheer stubbornness was more than enough fuel to get him up that torturous flight of stairs. Sure, Techno felt as if each step had been hewn into this damned tower with every intent to antagonize him, and him specifically. But here he was now, witnessing Filza about to make another undoubtedly big mistake. And that was all that mattered. Yes, Dream said, all former smugness wiped clean from his face. Tell him exactly what you're doing, Filza, where you're about to go. Shut up, Wilbur snapped, his eyes never wavering from his father. This doesn't concern you, you nosy piece of shit. Father. Filza, a god among gods among men, flinched at the harshness in Wilbur's tone. What did he mean? Where are you going? When Filza didn't respond, a look of horrified fury dawned on Wilbur's face. You're leaving, Wilbur said, as if the act of saying it might make it false. You're actually leaving me again. Well, Filza began, loosening his grip on Dream for just one second. Techno knew a thing or two about stupid mistakes. That was one of them. The moment Filza's hand slackened, Dream pulled free and was gone, taking to the skies on his invisible wings. It was almost comical, really, to think that the god that had once stood over them so arrogantly just hours before would now scramble to escape the second everyone's backs were turned. If it was Filza's ascension that had caused the shift, then Techno would gladly sacrifice his immortality ten times over just to see the green bastard scared shitless. Fuck! Filza cursed under his breath as he spread his own wings, about to give chase. But before he could even lift one foot off the tower floor, Wilbur and Techno had already taken their positions. It took four seconds. One, Wilbur knocked in an obsidian-fletched arrow into his bow, drawing his arm back as he aimed toward the lone figure in the burning sky. Two, the linked iron chains of Techno's whip rattled as it unfurled from his hand like a metal ribbon. He took one end of it and spun it in a vicious circle, the wind whirling around him, lifting his hair from his face. He was almost delirious with pain, and he did not have the fraction of the strength he used to have. But if Wilbur was still standing, then Techno would be right beside him. 3. Wilbur breathed in and out. His hands were steady and sure. He was a king, and he would surrender to no god. 4. Wilbur let the arrow fly. It sang through the air, sang past the green god's head, not close enough to make him bleed, but close enough to make him pause. It was all they needed. In that moment of his foolish hesitation, Technoblade swung his whip out like a fisherman casting his hook into the deep dark. It blazed like a comet in reverse, arcing up into the shattered sky instead of toward the burning ground, justice made metal. It caught around the heel of a god and made him mortal in his fear. And if Techno had any godliness left in him, he used it all in that one last act of retribution. He had known, of course, that even the weakest human was able to do impossible things, godly things, in moments of panic. He had heard stories of fathers lifting whole trees off their children, of people standing between their lovers and wild wolves. He had witnessed soldiers fighting to their bitter ends, all for a king that did not love them, and a kingdom that would forget their names the moment a new battle began. A young boy had stood before him in a wisteria-covered pavilion, and asked to be taught the art of war to keep his brother safe. Humans, Techno thought, we're a stubborn bunch, aren't we? And he drew the spider down from the stars. Dream hurtled back toward them, an angel fallen and falling still, and Techno swung him straight toward the bell. There was a cacophony as the bell's binding snapped and it crashed to the floor, still ringing, still singing. In its dented surface laid a god in repose, blood staining his golden hair, unconscious, defeated at last. 
Techno let out a shaky breath. Well, he said, that was easy, and promptly passed out. Wilbur let his bow clatter to the ground and caught Techno before he could follow it. Laughter exploded out of Wilbur as he pulled Techno's limp body against him. We did it, he exhaled into Techno's hair, looking down at the god lying broken and dented bronze. We actually fucking did it. Techno. He shook Techno. Techno? Hey, we, we did it. There was no response. Wilbur looked up in panic and found his father's weary eyes on him. No. The frenzied euphoria of an unexpected victory died swiftly on Wilbur's lips as he pulled Techno closer to him, tucking his warm, fragile, mortal body into the cradle of his arms, Techno's chin digging painfully into Wilbur's shoulder. Wilbur was suddenly very aware of the extent of the damage on him, wounded shoulders and a knife to the back, courtesy of Wilbur himself. A killing blow for you would be a scratch for me, Techno had said, but he'd said it when he was immortal and untouchable. Techno? Wilbur asked again, shaking him lightly, unable to think of a world without his best friend. His newfound mortality should have given them years, at least, together. Not minutes. Not seconds. T techno This isn't funny anymore. He looked up at his father. Tell him it isn't funny anymore. The silence was thunderous. And then, in its wake, there was a muffled groan. Five minutes. Just five goddamn minutes. Wilbur pulled back to see that Techno's eyes were wide open. If I weren't sure you were halfway to hell already, Wilbur said slowly, I would expedite the process right now. Does hell offer a hot meal and a warm bed? Asked Techno. If so, please send me there. I deserve it. Wilbur shoved Techno off him, unsure whether to laugh or cry or scream. When he turned to his father, he looked just as lost. That was a very shit thing to do father said as Techno righted himself. You little bastard. Oh? The wry mirth fled instantly from Techno's face, chased by unbridled anger as he whirled on father. You want to speak to me of doing very shit things? Father flinched, but looked as if he had already expected the outburst. His blue eyes slid to Wilbur, and they looked so much like Tommy's in his final moments, when Wilbur did not know whether to look away or memorize them. Father's hands around Dream's wrists, Dream's panicked flight, the dark doorway into a realm between realms still standing far below them in the shadow of the bell tower. You're actually leaving me again, Wilbur had accused him before they were swept into the dramatics of Dream's escape and their presumed triumph. What triumph was there to celebrate when Father had not proven him wrong? The cold settled back into Wilbur's bones. Where are you going? Wilbur demanded. Will, Father began, running a shaking hand through his hair. You were not supposed to be here for this. He met Techno's glare. Neither of you were. Techno crossed his arms, the mortal who had chained a god. If he had given anyone else the look he was giving father, it would have withered away into dust. And what exactly is this, Phil? Techno asked, his voice hoarse. The angel of death did not frown or make excuses. He simply told them what Wilbur had always wanted from him. The truth. I'm going away. Far, far away. Filza continued, unable to stop now that he had started. Maybe it was the way that Wilbur was looking at him, open and undefended, as if he no longer feared, but instead expected this betrayal. Maybe it was the way Techno stood protectively in front of him, as if Filza was someone Wilbur needed protection from. Maybe it was that, despite their earlier tearless farewell, deep down, Filza knew it would come down to this. No subterfuge, no vague remarks, just honesty this time, no matter how harsh and painful. I'll take Dream to a place where he can't hurt you, can't hurt anyone, ever again. I'm going to lock the door behind me and throw away the key. It's the only way I can make sure he doesn't come back. The only way? Wilbur asked. The only way to end the reign of an all-powerful deity just so happens to involve you leaving me in the dust for- How many times now is it, Filza? How many times are you going to leave me before you even say a proper fucking goodbye? We already- Don't give me that shit! Wilbur snapped, his brown eyes furious. He'd gotten his eyes from his mother, the fury from his father. A few words of wisdom and a piece of fucking jewelry does not count as a goodbye in any goddamn universe. I asked you, I fucking asked you, if it was goodbye. Goodbye then, said Filza. Is that what you wanted? Did you want me to say the words? Did you want me to tell you that I would give up air and life and open skies if it meant I got to stay with you? But if you want honesty, Wilbur, here it is. You already know the face of sacrifice well. You have already made the calculations in your head, and you already know this is the right call. 
The only call. You already know this will hurt like hell, but it will be a necessary hurt. This is my Blue Valley, Wilbur. He saw the words land, felt it as if he'd taken a dagger to his own heart. Wilbur had the look of a man standing at the gallows, but this was not his execution. And that tortured sorrow in his eyes, torn between grieving and refusing to believe there was anything to grieve at all. That was from Filza too. Through it all, Techno had stood in his stoic silence, content on making Filza feel the weight of his anger without having to say a word. But now, he opened his mouth to speak, but it wasn't a demand, or a dry remark, or a sharp reproach that fell out in quiet, hesitant syllables. It was a question. Wilbur, can I see that necklace? His anguish momentarily clouded by confusion, Wilbur reached into his pocket and pulled out Filza's last gift, the only remnant that would remain of him. Sitting on Wilbur's palm, dangling from an iron chain, was a single, bright green emerald. I'm sorry, Filza began. I'm sorry that leaving you is the only way I can save you. I'm sorry that you both fought so hard, so long, just to say goodbye again. I'm sorry I can't be here for the aftermath. I'm sorry that there's too much left unsaid between us. I'm sorry that I was too much of a coward to say this all before, but I hope I can make it up to you now. He tried for a smile, even as tears blurred his vision, turning everything into hazy smudges. Will, Techno, I... And then arms were going around him, pulling him into a warm embrace. For a moment, there was only a tangle of limbs and three beating broken hearts, indiscriminate from one another. Clarity came in bittersweet waves. It was Wilbur's face buried in his left shoulder, Techno's arms around them both. It was Techno's foot on his toes, and the pommel of Wilbur's rapier digging into his gut. It was tragic, and it was clumsy, and it was goodbye. It won't be forever, fills a promise through sobs. I swear on you both, I will find a way back to you. Someday, there will be nothing to fear anymore, and I'll find you again, even if it takes me eons. None of them said what they were all thinking. Wilbur didn't have eons, and neither did Techno now, but they both knew what he meant anyways, and they believed him. Someday. They would hang on to that promise. They would take it to their graves. If there's one thing that I want you to know, Wilbur said, pulling back to look Filza in the eyes. I forgive you. His face fractured into a million different emotions. I forgive you, Dad. Thank you, Phil whispered. Thank you, my boy. And Techno only had his silence, but it said more than Filza could in a thousand years. He stepped back from them, his oldest son and his oldest friend. When Techno began swaying on his feet, Wilbur wordlessly wrapped his arm around the former gods, and they stood there together leaning on each other, and Filza's heart was free. He gave them a nod. Techno looked away to wipe furiously at his eyes. Filza had to stifle a laugh. Stubborn, until the very end, aren't you, my friend? It was time. The god of freedom turned toward the boy sleeping on the broken bell, sleeping, or waiting, or dreaming, whichever explanation would hurt least for him. Filza gathered the green god into his arms, as he had once bore the body of his youngest son at his deathbed as he had once carried Wilbur to bed when he was smaller, and the world was only the hallway from the library to his childhood bedroom. He walked to the very edge of the tower, with only a young king and a new mortal to mourn him. He spread his wings, obsidian feathers gleaming in the dying fires of the last city he would ever fail to protect. And then he flew. He did not look back. The wind was at his face, cold and cutting, but he had never tasted anything sweeter. When he began his descent, Straight toward the gate to his final fate, he felt the green god stir slightly in his arms, a child disturbed from a beautiful dream. He might have whispered a name, but it was lost to the air. God. Such a big word for such a small thing. They were the beginning, and they would be the end. Prologue and epilogue. The void rushed toward them. Filza closed his eyes. It was better this way. He would get to control the darkness. It was his call. His terms. His sacrifice. I'm sorry, Tommy, he thought, one last tear slipping down his ancient face. But I'll be seeing you soon. They entered the void together, the gate closed behind them. And the universe shifted. The shift was felt by every soul. It was felt by every rock and every blade of grass, every flowing river and every tree looking over a lonely house at the end of a long road, its chimney overgrown with ivy. It was felt by every beast in the forest, and every fish in the sea, and every bird now grieving a fellow wanderer of the skies. It was felt by those awake, and those hunting, and those deep in hibernation, 
and those spinning their webs from branch to branch, creating connections where once there had only been open air. It was felt by the deer caught between the wolf's jaws, its final moments extended into eternity as the entire world, the entire universe, held its breath. It was felt by every warrior in combat, every monarch on their gilded throne, every smith with their cheeks warm from the fires of their forges, every child stumbling through their mother's garden, every painter seated at their easel, every sailor at sea, every traveler on their way home. It was felt by an old neighbor looking after the shop of the girl who had always been so kind to him. A sign stood at the door, closed indefinitely, it said, but the neighbor knew it would be closed forever, and still he'd come, day after day. His wife was gone, and so was the kind girl. But the flowers, oh, they still needed watering. It was felt by a god in a valley. Beside him was a fresh dug grave with only a sword of pure obsidian to mark its place among the dead. But God had always known he would one day stand alone. Once there were three, and now there was one. He'd lost one of them to love, and the other to fear. And some days, he wondered if there was any difference. When pain always came in the wake of love, when every devotion led to a burial ground, when every dream was a nightmare sleeping, would it be worth loving at all? Yes, said the dirt beneath his fingernails, testimony to his lonely grave digging. Yes, said the wind coming in from the north. Yes, said the first drop of rain striking his cheek, like a cold reminder to seek shelter, like a gentle kiss from two lost friends. Yes, it would. It was felt by a soldier knocking on the door of a home he could no longer recognize. When his sister opened the door, he swore she didn't recognize him either. But then she threw her arms around him, sobbing into his dirty shirt, and they fell onto the wooden floors that carried the weight of their shared childhoods and its scratches and dents. He held her and cried, and was known. It was felt by a young king standing on a bell tower at the heart of a city of snow and ash. A green stone gleamed at his throat heavy with a history that would someday be told when its last storyteller was ready. It was felt by the storyteller. The wheel was broken at their feet. They were free. They were free. They were free. Wilbur leaned his weary head against Techno's shoulder. Let's go home, he whispered. Techno nodded. Home, he repeated, as if the word was a new discovery. And as he watched, an aurora blazed to life above them, a symphony of reds and golds and greens twisting through the heavens, an impossibility of color, nothing short of divine magic. The sky was singing. Techno turned to the king, but his face was upturned in a glow, a child, truly, captivated by the pretty lights, the heaviness of his own heart momentarily forgotten as he looked up at the brilliance of their world, the world his father had saved. The curtain fell on two brothers illuminated. They buried him under the weeping willow, and they replanted the garden around him, one rose bush at a time. Wilbur leaned against the simple gravestone as he tuned his guitar. It bore a name, and the only titles that ever mattered to him, brother and son. I'm not nervous, said Wilbur, as he continued tinkering with the instrument on his lap. He flinched as a rather discordant note played before continuing. I mean, I shouldn't be. Whatever happens today, I would deserve it. That's how justice works, right? Finally satisfied with his strings, Wilbur strummed a few notes before he settled back against the grass. But I didn't come here to talk about that. I wanted to play you a song. He grinned at the sunlight streaming through the branches. I finally finished it. It took a while. A full year of banging around the music room, drawled an all-too-familiar voice, and threatening to suffocate me in my sleep if I interfered with his artistic process. Wilbur glared good-naturedly at the man coming towards him, a violin case in hand. Techno had grown into his mortality better than Wilbur had expected. There were still times that Techno forgot he had human needs and human limitations, but Wilbur was there, as he always had been and always would be, to remind him. Other than the times he forgot to eat on a regular schedule, or thought to spar with royal guards that would no longer be easy targets for him, he had thrived. He'd begun filling in his tunics, and his wounds from that final confrontation were now just a part of his tapestry of scars. Settling on the other side of the gravestone, anyone looking out the windows of the castle would only see the head advisor and right hand of the king, with his old-fashioned poofy sleeves and pink hair braided down his back, silently plucking at his violin. I was just saying, Wilbur said. That whatever the verdict, 
We'd accept it, Techno finished, brows scrunched in serious contemplation at his instrument. That doesn't mean you're not allowed to be scared. That's why we're here, aren't we? He threw a grin at Wilbur across the strings. We're getting you a distraction. I'm not scared, Wilbur said. And it was the truth. I know there's a chance that the past two years of atoning might not be enough. And I know it will never be enough. Then it's a good thing you're not the one voting, Techno said simply. It's the people's call, Wilbur. We don't have any say in the matter. For better, or for worse. He tapped the end of his bow against the gravestone, almost absently, before raising it to his violin. At the end of the day, you're either king or you aren't. And if they decide the latter, then we'll go off into exile together, and be twin fishermen in some little coast town somewhere. Or traveling bards. We could see the world together, you and I. I've already seen it, said Techno. But I suppose I wouldn't mind getting a second look. Wilbur laughed lightly. If that's our worst case scenario, then there's really nothing to fear, is there? In response, Techno began playing the first notes of a familiar melody. Soon, the lilting sound of his violin filled the garden, joined by distant bird song and the rustle of the wind through the creeping branches. It floated through the air, sharp and sweet, Techno's scarred fingers dancing across the fingerboard with an expertise that had cost him long nights and strings snapping against his skin. His bow rung magic from the delicate instrument, so potent Wilbur almost missed his own cue. Wilbur began playing his guitar, an accompaniment and an addition, the undercurrent to the keening sounds of Techno's violin. One note after another, an orchestra of two performing for an audience of ghosts, following a score they wrote themselves. It was a sad song. It was a happy song. It was a song of a summer day from years ago, tucked between faded memories like a flower pressed between the pages of a heavy book, now dusted off and clean. It was a song of an artist mother and a warrior father, and sons that were both. It was a song about the grass beneath Wilbur's feet, and the sweet scent of flowers in his lungs. It was a song about war and ruin, and grief and loss, and the nightmares that still managed to take him by surprise even when he was awake and living anyway. It was a song about love and all the ways to say it. Sacrifice and a cup of hot tea waiting at his desk. Chess during the lazy days, and music during the hard ones. Leaving and staying, remembering and forgetting. It was a song about family, born or made, or found or rediscovered. It was Tommy's grave at his back, mother's unfinished painting, father's necklace around his throat. And when the final note echoed off into silence, there was no standing ovation, no raucous applause. Just like the voices for the past two years, six months, and three days, there was only silence. It was the most beautiful sound. Wilbur quietly placed his guitar against Tommy's gravestone and turned to see Techno wordlessly returning his violin to its case. Everything had already been said. In the distance, the bells began to toll. It was time. Techno offered Wilbur a hand and pulled him to his feet. Together, they walked towards their judgment. Two years ago, Wilbur had stood on a balcony and faced an army ready to die for him. I promised you peace on my father's crown, he had said, and now I call you to war. This is nothing less than treason. Rest assured, I will be facing consequences for it. And the soldiers had instead called for their enemies' heads. More than half of them were dead now, leaving family and friends behind. Alive and safe, but mourning. And if there was anyone who understood the need to find some place to put down blame, it was Techno. There were no enemies left to defeat, no smiling gods to imprison, no hostile armies crossing the valley. And that was why Techno and Wilbur were standing in the hazy sunlight, pouring in from the high windows of the very room where Wilbur had once been crowned. The room where he might have that crown taken from him for good. In front of them, seated in pews and on the floor, or leaning against the marble columns, or watching from the balconies, were the people that would determine their fates. A hundred blinking eyes, all unreadable, settled on the king and the general that had won both battle and war, at the cost of the very people they'd sworn to protect. Never mind that they'd saved them from a worse fate, never mind that they'd ensured the safety of the kingdom for generations to come, or that they'd spent the past two years working on pulling the threads of their nation back together. Those were excuses that neither Wilbur nor Techno would ever use against their people. Before them were four jars, each towering over them, one for each quadrant, west and east, south and north. 
For the past few months, those jars had combed through every inch and corner of the kingdom, from the highest mountains to the smallest villages tucked into the deepest forests, to the cold, snow-covered tundra towns. Messengers had knocked at the door of each house, presenting each person within, be they child or adult, a decision. They would take a rock, any rock, be it from their own gardens or from the riverbed, or chipped from the threshold of their houses, and place it in the jar if they believed the king and the general had not done enough in service to the kingdom. A representative stood behind each jar, ready to tip it over, ready to count. Enough votes, and Wilbur would step down from the throne, and Tecna would go with him, and they lived the rest of their mortal lives in exile, far from the kingdom they had bled, and fought, and lost their brother for. Tecno glanced at Wilbur. Despite his earlier posturing, Tecno could tell Wilbur was one tug away from unraveling. He stood shoulder to shoulder with Tecno, trying to look calm and stoic for his people, spine straight and eyes ahead. Only Tecno could see the apprehension behind them. He loved this kingdom. He loved its people. It wasn't just his father's kingdom, or his mother's, or Tommy's. He'd given everything of himself into it. It was his own flesh and blood. It was no longer a chore, or something he had to succeed in to earn a distant father's approval. It was the soldiers that had fought beside him in the valley. It was the half a hundred people that had been willing to bring down a mountain on their foes, and on themselves. It was the scars on his skin, and his sleepless nights and his pride, and his home, and his responsibility. He was born for this, stones and all. A judge draped in white robes called for attention, as if the room had not been mind-numbingly quiet for the past half hour. Citizens of our fair kingdom, the judge said, we gather today to bear witness to the conclusion of the trial of King Wilbur, protector of the realm, ruler of the kingdom, and Technoblade, formal general to the royal army. The people have spoken, now all there is left to do is listen. He turned to Wilbur, his gray eyebrows raising in question. Would you like to say one last thing, your majesty, before we tip the jars? Wilbur opened his mouth, closed it, and began shaking his head. Techno stepped forward. The king, he began, as well as I, thank you all for coming here today. I see familiar faces in the crowd. I fought next to you, have seen your bravery firsthand, and I know what it cost you all to come here today. He took a deep breath, meeting every eye on the floor in mezzanine. It felt like standing before the dead. It felt like a reckoning long overdue. Everyone here lost someone to the war. A friend, a parent, a neighbor. And you know what your king lost too. Though we are united in our loss, that does not excuse the lapse in mine and Wilbur's judgments. We made mistakes. Deadly ones. We believed ourselves invincible and were too late to act against the encroaching enemy. And you all paid for a price that should have been ours alone. Whatever you all have decided today, we will call it justice. That is all. When Techno stepped back, Wilbur caught at his sleeve. He anticipated a dry remark about his unexpected diplomacy, and was surprised when Wilbur simply mouthed, Thank you. Techno nodded hesitantly at him, confused as to what there was to be thankful for. After all, he was only doing his job. The judge read out more legal jargon that Techno had already heard a hundred times, and then, with the very hands he had used to put a crown on Wilbur's head, he gestured for the jars to be overturned. They looked like vases. They gleamed like urns. Wilbur's hand slipped into Techno's, his bitten down nails digging into Techno's knuckles. Techno closed his eyes. He did not know which gods would still listen to him, so he prayed to them all. The war god, Dream, Vilza. Exile or exoneration, it was out of his hands. He would be ready for both. Techno waited for the clatter of stones on marble. It never came. The boy who had come of age in blood and fire stood before a lake with his fist curled gently around a stone. The surface of the lake was calm and still, a mirror of the sky above it, and Tubbo wondered what it would feel like to float in it, to swim in sunlight. By this time, in a city far from here, the king and the general Tubbo had followed into war would be counting the votes of those who wanted them gone. Tubbo ran his thumb across the smooth edge of the stone in his hand, turning it idly between his fingers as he looked out at the lake. It would freeze over soon, when winter came but Tubbo would be ready. He pulled his hand back and through, with all his might. The stone skipped once, twice, thrice, across the surface before sinking into the blue sky, leaving ripples that disappeared in the blink of an eye, and the lake was still once more. Tubbo grabbed the axe that hung from his hip. It was starting to rust, and constant use had worn away the handle, but it would hold for just a bit more. It was a familiar, reliable weight in his hand, and he swung it beside him as he walked toward the forest. He needed more firewood to keep his sister warm. Time unfurled like a ribbon. They filled their days with mundane problems. 
untuned instruments, tea turning cold, and weeds needing plucking. The dutiful, benevolent king in his right hand, who struggled to stay awake during half of the political meetings, and spent the other half actively antagonizing psychophants he deemed too irksome. Wilbur had publicly proclaimed that there was nothing amusing about Techno threatening to burn the pompous wig of a merchant trying to lobby trade routes away from local vendors, but his eyes had gleamed with the promise of later laughter. In the spring, the two of them went down to the orchards and spent their days in friendly rivalry over who picked the most fruit. Most years, Techno won, if only because Wilbur was often distracted by a woman with long, curling hair as red as the apples in her basket. It took him two years to ask her name, and another two to ask her to marry him. Her name was Sally and she said yes. When their first child was born, a baby boy with hair the color of Tommy's last sunset, Wilbur took him into his arms without hesitation. He pressed his tear-stained cheek against his son's warm skin and whispered, I will love you forever, over and over, until he was sure his son knew it. And the son would grow up under no one's shadow, calling Wilbur dad and techno uncle in a kingdom of hard-won peace. In time, he would know the story of the Blue Valley and the story of his other uncle, and the story of his grandparents. But until then, he would think all gods were kind, and his father never cried. His uncle would carve his height into the marble column of the ivy-covered pavilion where he learned how to paint, and he would wonder why his father's brother would turn away whenever he passed the almost faded marks of the boy that had stood there before him. The heir of the Angel of Death's kingdom, and all the heirs after him, would not have gilded hair or eyes like a frozen tundra. They would have gentle hands and would forgive easily, they would be raised on honey and apple pies, and stories about frogs in the rain, and the wheel would never break them. And on the night before an ancient crown would be placed upon their brow, those that came before them would press a gift into their hand, and it would be their inheritance. So when a winged man would appear from the north, days, years, or eons from now, he would find a familiar stone around the neck of a child that he would recognize right away by the familiar shape of their smile, and he would know he was home. He had a life before this. A mother, a father, a home, sisters and brothers. But what he had now was alright too. He stood alone in front of his bedroom mirror, combing his hair back from his face to braid it for the day, tucking it behind an ear where a sapphire earring hung, etching the sunlight. He paused when he saw it, leaning in close to make sure it wasn't a trick of the light or the lingering traces of a dream. He blinked once, twice, his mortal heart catching in his throat. There, nestled amongst the pink strands, delicate as a bird's wing, was a single gray hair. If he listened carefully, he could hear his brother coming down the hallway, looking for him. But this moment was his alone. Half sobbing, half laughing, he fell against his chair and closed his eyes against the sudden sting of tears. He could see in his mind a field of flowers under an open sky, a place made for waiting, where all the finished stories went, where he too would go someday. A knock came at his door, and Technoblade began to smile. <laughs>